We will begin in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. If you'd like to go ahead and turn to that passage, we'll read from that section of Scripture in just a moment. But first, allow me just a few minutes to make some <clears throat> remarks as we have come to the last session of this series of meetings that began on Thursday. I've been looking forward to being here for some time, and it's hard to believe now that we've already come to the end of this particular effort, but I do want to express again to the congregation here how thankful I am for the invitation to be with you during this series, and I'm so glad that I've had my family here. We're leaving here so encouraged by the time that we've been able to spend together in these few days and engaging in these spiritual things. It's been such a blessing to us. And I hope that something that's been said, something that we've studied, will be helpful to you as we've gone through this, this series together. Thank you again for, for having us and hosting us and allowing us to be with you and to take part in this special time together. It's been good to be with the Deatons again. They left us. I think it was last August, and it's been good to have this time with them, and I know that you are thankful to have Stephen and his family here and to have him working with you, and it's our hope that you will encourage one another, continue to encourage one another as you labor together in the work of the gospel, and I appreciate the hospitality that's been shown to us by various ones that's been so enjoyable. And it's always wonderful to be with the deans and to have time with them and with their family. Always such a wonderful blessing and bond that we share. And what else was I supposed to say, Rachel? I don't think I got it all, but she is, uh, as I've often said, like my little sister. I never had a little sister to pick on growing up, and she has gladly and valiantly filled that role for me over the years and uh, just just love spending time with them anytime we have the opportunity to do so i also want to acknowledge the others who have been working as we've had this meeting going on i appreciate the song leaders both elijah's and then uh, last night, Mike, and this morning, John, and the work that they have done and, and contributed in helping us to worship together and to edify one another. And I appreciate how they have taken time to try and select songs that go along with the theme and with the lesson to help us to focus our minds on what we've been in, engaged in studying. That's been so helpful to us. Uh, appreciate our brother Ron and the announcements and the way that he has conducted those announcements, I'll tell you, to me, that's a big deal. I'd rather preach a sermon than do announcements any day. But he handles that like a pro, and I appreciate the way that he has done so. Uh, and then our brother Rick, um, I've put him through the ringer, I think. It, he does such a good job with the, the audiovisual and all of that, and uh, I have a tendency to not stay still. And so... <laughs> I've given him a run for his money in trying to keep up with where I'm at as far as where the camera is supposed to be and appreciate his work too. And it's all who have been here and, and all of the encouraging remarks that you've made and just your attitude and your desire for the things of God has been such a blessing and encouragement as we've had this time together. So I encourage you to press on. Press on in doing the work of the Lord here. Thank you so much again for having us. As we have been discussing, we're talking about trusting God in troubled times, and we want to conclude this series on that theme by focusing on our hope as Christians. And so we begin in Ephesians chapter 4, where by inspiration of the Spirit, the Apostle Paul speaks concerning the one hope of the child of God. Notice with me in verses 4 through 6 of Ephesians 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. As human beings, 
living in this world, we may hope for and look forward to all sorts of things. We may say, well, I hope I can find a better job. A person who is single will say, well, I hope I find the right person to marry. The one who's in school will say, well, I hope I graduate on time, or graduate with honors. Or he may say, I hope I get my taxes filed on time. Now, that's, that's a real thing. The government extended the deadline. And if anybody's not aware, it's tomorrow. And so you may be sitting here thinking, I hope I get that done by tomorrow. Or we may be looking forward to something. Well, you know, we're coming up on the summer. I'm looking forward to a vacation. Or I'm looking forward to a birthday party coming up next week. Or I'm looking forward to the big game that I'm going to watch with my friends. Whatever it may be. In spite of all those things that consume our thoughts and anticipation from day to day, we have to come back to the fact that the Word of God assures us that for the saved, there is only one hope that is of any real and lasting consequence. You thought about what that is, what hope is? The word hope that we see in our New Testaments is translated from a Greek word which according to Thayer's lexicon is defined as this. The joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. When we see the word hope in the New Testament, we need to have that thought in our minds. And so therefore we should understand that when the Apostle Paul writes of one hope, he's not using the word hope in the same manner in which we often use it. What I mean is that this word hope, this kind of hope, is not the same thing as wishful thinking. It's not like hoping the stock market goes up. It's not like hoping the gasoline prices come down. It's not like blowing out the candles on your birthday cake and making a wish. It's not like sitting in front of the TV and hoping your team wins the big game when you have no control over the outcome. Instead, the hope of the child of God is the confident expectation of a certain future outcome. What I want to say to you today is that this true hope is found only in Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, in the opening lines of his first letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul says this. Notice in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. In a very real sense, the one who came into this world as God in the flesh and suffered in the flesh, having his blood shed to take away our sins, he is truly our hope. And the reason is, the reason why he's described that way is that he alone can offer the confident expectation of a certain future outcome to all who will come to Him on His terms for forgiveness and salvation. Think about Mark chapter 16 after Jesus' resurrection in verses 15 and 16. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Do you see the confidence? Do you see the certainty of the expectation for the one who obeys the gospel? That one will be saved. And then we have other passages of Scripture we might turn to that produce that same kind of confidence 
The Lord is not saying, if you do this, this might happen. If you do this, then it may work out. He says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He provides confidence. And when you've obeyed the gospel, and you have Christ at the center of your life, then you have hope. Only then can you truly live in joyful and confident expectation of what lies ahead. But consider what the Bible says about our hope. Now notice Romans chapter 8, because we need to be reminded that we have neither seen nor realized the ultimate outcome of our hope yet. In Romans chapter 8 and verses 24 and 25, Paul says, For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We haven't seen the fulfillment of our hope yet. But we can place our full confidence in what the Word of God describes as that which lies ahead of us. So how do the Scriptures describe our hope? Well, first of all, the Scriptures describe our hope as eternal life. That is the hope of the Christian. Notice Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. According to the Apostle Paul, through the grace of God, we have opportunity to have eternal life. And notice how he puts it here as we back up to verse 4. And let's read verses 4 through 7 of Titus 3. He says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appear." not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The hope of the faithful Christian is the hope of eternal life life. Now you think about our lives here on earth. Our lives on earth are really so brief. So brief. Even if we live several decades, what is that in the grand scheme of things? So brief are our lives on this earth that James describes them in James chapter 4 and verse 14 as a vapor. James 4 and verse 14, For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You think about that pot of water boiling on the stove and that vapor that comes up. It's there for a second and then it's gone. James says that's what your life on earth is like. Even if it lasts 70, 80, 90, 100 years, that is brief in the grand scheme of things. It's like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. That's what our earthly lives are like. Whether we realize it right now or not. But the child of God lives in the confident expectation of living on forever beyond the resurrection, beyond the final judgment, because that's what the Lord has promised. You think about the occasion when Lazarus of Bethany died in John chapter 11. And Jesus and His disciples traveled there to Bethany and met with the sisters of Lazarus, Martha and Mary. First with Martha. And notice what happened here in that encounter. In John 11 and verses 23 through 26, Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? You see what the Lord is talking about here? 
Yes, our lives in this world will end. Our lives here are brief. But this is a hope that sees beyond the grave. This is a hope that extends beyond the here and now. Beyond physical death. And beyond the future and final resurrection of the dead. Now, let me tell you something as we think about this concept of our hope being eternal life. Our hope is more than just eternal existence. We need to understand that all people, whether righteous or wicked, all people will continue to consciously exist beyond the judgment. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus lays out the scene of the final judgment. And here He is seated enthroned as the King who is dividing the sheep from the goats, those who have done His will from those who have not. And in verse 46 of Matthew 25, He says of those in the left hand, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And I want you to know that for whatever reason, as I'm reading from the New King James here, and your Bible may read the same, that for whatever reason here, we have the words everlasting and eternal in English in this verse, but the Greek terms are the same. There's no difference. Everlasting, eternal in this passage. One is the same duration as the other. Everlasting eternal everyone has that kind of existence an existence that goes beyond this earthly life beyond physical death beyond the final resurrection and so what i'm saying is that our hope of eternal life is not just to keep on existing forever and ever Everyone's going to keep on existing forever and ever. Our hope is to have a life with God forever and ever, in which we exist in permanent, uninterrupted fellowship with Him in His very presence for all eternity. You see, the faithful Christian isn't looking for heaven on earth. The faithful Christian is looking forward with confidence to the certainty of having a dwelling place with God for eternity. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14 on the night of His betrayal? As He spoke to the apostles there on that occasion. In John 14, beginning in verse 1, to let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is the hope of eternal life. The Lord is preparing a place for us to dwell with Him in His presence forever and ever. That's our hope. That's our hope as God's people. Now, the Bible also describes our hope as being living and incorruptible. Notice with me 1 Peter chapter 1. This is the hope of the Christian according to the Apostle Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. The apostle says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. According to Peter, God has given the faithful a living hope 
through Christ, which involves an inheritance that is incorruptible. Now, many of our religious friends and neighbors, I want you to know, actually consider the hope of heaven to be a dead hope at this point. And I say that because what has happened in so many cases among our religious friends and neighbors is that they have succumbed to the call of modernism. What they have done is that they have given up on the supernatural. The miracles like the one that we spent time studying in our Bible class period this morning have been dismissed or ignored or redefined and they have reduced the Bible to being a fallible book written by fallible ancient men. And so what has happened is that they have removed their focus from the next life and have given up on the reality of a future beyond this earthly existence. Oh, yes, they may say there are some useful things in the Bible and in the moral teachings of Jesus, but let's not take too seriously what the Bible says about heaven and hell and what's to come after this. And after all, these were just the ideas of some ancient ignorant men who lived a long time ago and they wrote them down. So we know that that's not really to be taken very seriously. That's, that's in large part what is going on in the religious world today. That's what's taught in seminaries. That's what the preachers come away with. That's what they teach their congregants. That's what we see being played out. That mentality. And so for this reason, we see religious groups that do what? Well, they place nearly all of their emphasis and nearly all of their resources for constructing a better here and now. Embarking on a mission to feed and clothe the world. Building hospitals for the sick. Building and funding schools for the uneducated. Focusing on social welfare and social justice. Is that not what so many religious groups are dedicated to being involved in today? Well, let me tell you something. That's because they have given up on what the Bible says about our hope. But the hope of the Christian, the true hope of the Christian, is not just a better here and now. The true hope of the child of God is a living hope. It's not dead. It hasn't gone by the wayside. It's a living hope and it involves an incorruptible inheritance that is reserved not here in this world, but in heaven for you. Now you know, nearly everything in this world is subject to death and decay and corruption. The hope of the child of God is more permanent than any earthly hope or expectation. <clears throat> no matter what we may hope for in this life, just think about it. No matter what we may hope for in this life, we are forced to recognize the painful reality that our money will be spent until it runs out. Our cars, our shiny new cars, will be driven until they rust out. Our clothes will be worn until they wear out. Now guys, I don't know if you're like me, but I've, you know, my wife comes to me from time to time and she says, look, that t-shirt, it's got to go. I mean, it's worn, it's threadbare, it's got holes in it, I mean, the sleeve is falling. And I say, but that's, I, I, you don't understand. I, I mean, I, you don't know how long I've had that. That's my special shirt. She's right. It's done. It's got to go. That's what happens. 
Right? Things wear out and break down. They don't last. It's not permanent. You know, that's true of our physical bodies as well. They eventually give up. And you see, in this, in this temporary, decaying, and the fleeting nature of all that we see around us in this world, the Lord is impressing upon us a lesson about the hope of the saved, which is rooted in a reward that is incorruptible that is undefiled, that does not fade away. It is the opposite of what we observe in this earthly existence. The faithful Christian lives in confident expectation of a permanent reward in heaven. In Colossians, the first chapter, in verses 3 through 5 of that first chapter, the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church in Colossae, says there in verses 3 through 5, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. There is a hope that is permanent. It's not here in this world. This is not what it's all about. There is a hope that is laid up in heaven. Paul says that's what he's thankful for. That we have that kind of hope. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 concerning our hope. In Matthew chapter 6 and verses 19 through 21, the Lord said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's promised us something better than anything that we could have here. He's promised us something that doesn't break down, that doesn't fall apart, that can't be stolen, that can't be spent till it runs out, that doesn't decay and fade away. Where are we placing our treasure? Where is our focus? What are we really looking forward to and holding on to? Our hope. That hope of heaven is living and incorruptible. Well, let's also notice that the Bible describes our hope as the anchor of the soul in Hebrews chapter 6. The hope of the Christian is the anchor of the soul. Notice what the inspired writer says here in Hebrews chapter 6. We'll read verses 17 through 20. And here as he talks about the promises that God made in carrying out His plan from ancient times, from the time of Abraham, he says, picking up in verse 17, thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge, to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner is entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The hope of eternal life with God in heaven as we've mentioned already, this is not just wishful thinking. This hope is not just a guess as to how things might turn out in the end. This hope is not just a guess as to what may lie over the horizon. 
The fact is that our Creator, who cannot lie, has made certain promises to us. And because of that, we look forward to the fulfillment of exactly what He has promised with the confident and unwavering expectation that it will be just as He said. Our hope is the anchor of the soul. You know what that means? It means our hope holds us in place. The writer of Hebrews, as we've just read here in the section that we've just looked at in Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 19 through 20, describes for us, paints for us in these words, a picture and the picture is that of Jesus, our Savior. He's in the presence of the Father in heaven. That's where He is. Now our hope is attached to us on one end. We're holding on to that hope. But it is anchored to Jesus at the other end. Think about what an anchor is. What's an anchor? Well, an anchor is that object that is tied to a line and it is launched somewhere unseen and it holds the ship in place so it doesn't move, so it doesn't drift. Its job is to keep the boat, to keep the ship from moving away from where it is supposed to be. That's what that anchor does. Years ago, shortly after Cynthia and I first got married, we made a trip down to Florida to visit relatives. And my uncle at that time, he had a boat and liked to go out fishing on the Gulf of Mexico. And so he took us out fishing one morning and we went out all day and, and we would find a good spot where the fish were biting, we were fishing for sea trout, and we'd put the anchor down and we'd sit there and just kind of drift a little bit and if the fish were biting, we'd stay there. And if they quit biting, we'd pull the anchor up and move to a different spot, put the anchor down and fish there for a while. And we did that a few different times. And then my uncle said to me, well, let's, let's pull up the anchor. Let's try a different spot over here. And so he sent me to go pull up the anchor. So I went and I was pulling up the anchor by hand and pulling up the rope. And I pulled up the rope and pulled up the rope. And I got to the end of the rope and no anchor. And we looked up and thought, where are we? We're not just in a little pond or even a lake. We're out on the gulf and thinking, how far did we go? How far did we drift? It's not a good feeling. Thankfully, we hadn't gone too far and we could find our way back to where we were supposed to be. But you lose your anchor. You're in trouble in a situation like that. Let me ask you something. What is it that keeps you in place as a follower of Jesus Christ. The anchor is what's supposed to keep the ship in place, keep the boat where it's supposed to be so it doesn't drift and move away. What is it that keeps you in place as a Christian where you're supposed to be? Is it not the hope of heaven that motivates us to remain constant and steadfast in our faithfulness to the Lord so that one day we can have that perfect reward of being with Him for eternity? Is it not our hope that holds us there and helps us to see that the struggle of all of this is worth it? Our hope is the anchor of the soul. Our hope reaches into a place we have not seen. And it holds us steady through the uncertainties and the changes and the trials and difficulties of our lives here below. The faithful Christian has an anchor of the soul to hold 
to hold us in place until the day that our hope is realized. What a beautiful thought. What a beautiful thought. Now, let me offer two observations for us to consider as we think about our hope. The first is that our hope is a glorious hope. In Titus chapter 2, notice what the Apostle Paul says here. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, as he talks about the salvation that's been made available in Jesus. Titus 2 and verses 11 through 14, the Apostle Paul says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works." The Apostle Paul here writes of those who are living godly lives looking, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Imagine for a moment what it will be like to see the Lord appear. To see Him descend from heaven in order to bring the saved of all ages home to His dwelling place, the dwelling place of Almighty God, where we will praise Him forever and ever before His throne. Imagine what that will be like. Let me tell you something. That is a hope that is worth fighting for. And if you're living in the confident expectation of being in heaven for eternity, then what that means is that you are living a pure and godly life instead of being entangled with sin so that you can have what the Lord has promised. That's the point that John makes in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3. He says, and everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. See, if you're living in that confident expectation that I'm going to be with the Lord when this life is over, that means you're purifying yourself. You're living by His instruction so that you know you're going to be with Him. If you're living in the confident expectation of being in heaven for eternity, what that also means is that you're not afraid to stand up for what is right and to defend the truth of God when the occasion demands. Notice what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. If you've got that hope, if you've got that confident expectation that I'm going to be in heaven, I'm going to be with the Lord for eternity, you're not afraid to stand up and say what needs to be said. You're not afraid to defend the Word of God when it's under attack. You're not afraid to tell people how to become a Christian and why it's important and what you did and why you did it and why you're a follower of Christ. You're not afraid to do that because of the hope that is within you. You know, we live in a world that is full of hopeless people. Hopeless people who are seeking to fill the void in their lives with what? Uh, with greed, right? if I can just get more money, I'll feel fulfilled. With possessions, if I can just have this or I can have that, I know that will make me happy. Or they're trying to fill the void with sexual immorality. They're trying to fill the void with drugs and alcohol. 
or they're trying to fill that emptiness with mindless entertainment and a host of other things when you know what? All they really need is Jesus Christ. Our hope, our hope is a glorious hope. And don't you ever let anyone tell you different. That's the first observation. But the second observation I'd like to share with you is this. There is no hope for the wicked beyond this life. In Proverbs chapter 11, notice what the inspired wise man says about this. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 7, when a wicked man dies, his expectation will perish. And the hope of the unjust perishes. Those who pursue the path of destruction while here on this earth, they should never expect to find themselves in heaven after this earthly life has ended. You know, we see it all the time. People who have lived wicked lives with no disregard for God, who have been immoral, and then these people die, right? These famous people, celebrities, musicians, movie stars, whatever it is, and what's the first thing that's said? Oh, now he's in heaven. Now she's gone to heaven. Yeah. Really? This person showed no regard for the Lord during his or her life, and now this person is supposed to be in heaven? That's not what the Bible says. That's not how this works. Don't ever forget that the boundaries of hope are established by the Lord. In 2 John in verse 9, the Apostle John says, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. See, the Lord has drawn a line around the doctrine of Christ, around the teaching of the Lord, around the Gospel. It is within the teaching of the Lord that we have fellowship with God. That's where our hope is found. Outside of that, you don't have God. There is no hope. And yet, and yet, some want to offer hope where God offers none. Now what I mean by that is that when we say that someone can be a faithful Christian while also at the same time engaging in things that the Bible condemns, we have a problem. When we say that someone can be a faithful child of God while also engaging in the social and recreational drinking of intoxicating drink, or we can... We can be a, you can be a faithful child of God even though you engage in this lascivious dancing or wearing lascivious clothing, revealing immodest clothing. Or you can be a faithful child of God while involved in an adulterous, unscriptural marriage. You know, you got divorced and for whatever reason and went and married somebody else. But yeah, you can be a faithful child of God under those circumstances. You know what we're doing when we say that? We're trying to offer hope where God hasn't offered hope. He doesn't offer hope outside of the doctrine of Christ. And when we say that, well, you, you know, this man, he's a, he's a gospel preacher, and yeah, he teaches false doctrine, soul-condemning error. But we'll overlook that. You know, he teaches false doctrine on divorce and remarriage teaching that people can be divorced and remarried for whatever reason, contradicting what the Lord said in Matthew 19. Or, yeah, this brother, you know, he teaches a distorted version of the Genesis account of the creation. Or, or this brother, you know, he's out here deceiving the hearts of the simple by teaching this AD 70 doctrine, 
teaching that the resurrection has already happened and Jesus has already come and, and the end of the world has already happened and the resurrection and all these things are already passed and that was all just connected to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 as some were teaching. We say, well, yeah, he teaches that, but we're going to, teach it. We're going to treat him as a faithful brother anyway. You know what we're doing? We're offering hope where God hasn't offered hope. That's outside of the doctrine of Christ. And so what I mean is that we need to make sure that our offer of hope is within the boundaries established by the Lord. There is no hope for those who transgress the doctrine of Christ. There is no hope for those who choose to sin and refuse to repent. And let me tell you something else this morning. Hell is hopeless. There are those who twist the Scriptures in order to try and teach that, oh, the punishment of hell, that's, that's just a temporary punishment. Yes, the Bible talks about hell, they say, but what happens is that the wicked, they simply just cease to exist. That's all that really happens. That's all hell really is. If you're wicked, you just, you just poof, you just kind of go out of existence when this life is over. You know what they're attempting to do when they teach that? They're attempting to offer just a meager little bit of hope that God does not offer. Because the truth is that hell is real and hell is unending. How did Jesus talk about it? Well, in Mark chapter 9, in verses 43 and 44, the Lord said, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go into hell, to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where there were does not die. And the fire is not quenched. How could the Lord have described it in any plainer terms to get us to understand that this is not something that is temporary. This is ongoing. This is conscious. This is eternal. This is everlasting punishment. Now, of all the descriptions the Bible provides of hell, whether that of everlasting destruction or the lake of fire which burns with brimstone or the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Of all these descriptions the New Testament gives of hell, one of the most terrible things that may be impressed upon our minds concerning hell is that it is a place that is without hope. Have you thought about that? Pain and suffering, those things are manageable when there's hope. When there's hope that relief lies ahead at some point. We can get through the pain and the suffering when we think it's going to get better. There's going to be relief. This is going to end. But hell is so terrible because there is no hope of relief. There is no prospect that it will end. For those who choose to remain in sin, there is no hope for the future. There is only the fearful prospect of punishment. But isn't it wonderful that even though all have sinned and fall short of His glory, our loving God has provided a glorious hope for those who would be His children. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. We didn't come up with it. But God, in His grace, 
in His mercy, because of His love, gives us hope. Based upon what the Lord has done for you, and based upon how you are living in response to Him, do you have today the confident expectation that you will live with Him for eternity? I guess what I'm really asking is, do you have hope? Don't live a wasted life for a few years here only to face a hopeless forever. It's not worth it. You can have all that the Lord has promised the faithful if you will come to Him on His terms and obey Him today. Now remember, this life here is short. Eternity, eternity never ends. Won't you obey the Lord so that you can have hope so that you can have the prospect of being with Him, so you can have the confident expectation that you know that no matter what happens here now, you're going to be with Him. You'll be in His dwelling place. You'll be before His throne. You'll see His face. And you'll have that life with Him forever and ever and ever. Don't you want that? If you would take out your songbook, and open to the song that has been selected as a song of encouragement and invitation for us, number 832. If you have never obeyed the Gospel, if you've never taken advantage of the Lord's offer of hope, there's water behind me here. We're ready to hear your confession that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We're ready to acknowledge that you're turning away from your sins. And we'd be happy to help to baptize you into Christ for the remission of your sins this morning. You can leave here having hope, having the confident expectation that you've obeyed the Gospel and you are going to be in heaven for eternity. We'd love to help you to have that confidence today. If as a child of God, you've gotten off track, maybe you've drifted away from that narrow path that leads to eternal life, if there's something in your life that jeopardizes that hope, some sin that needs correction, don't leave here not having dealt with it. Come back to the Lord this morning. We'd love to help you and encourage you being right with Him on His terms. We want you to leave here with hope. And if we can help you and assist you in those ways, won't you come down to the front now while we stand and while we sing?